we're going to go through every diuretic and each aspect of the kidney to understand how these diuretics work. And we're not going to do them in anatomic order because in truth, the proximal tubule and the cortical collecting duct diuretics, they're just not very strong diuretics. And so we're going to start with the strongest diuretic of all, the loop diuretic. In order to understand the loop diuretic, you need to understand how the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle works. The principal molecule here is the sodium potassium 2 chloride cotransporter. Here, two molecules of chloride, a molecule of sodium, and a molecule of potassium all bind this and are transported into the cell. One should quickly look and see that sodium and chloride are at much higher concentrations in the tubular fluid, and if as this molecule runs and transports these ions across the cell membrane, potassium would be quickly depleted. In order to avoid that, potassium is recycled out of the cell through something called the ROMK channel. But when that happens, what is normally an electroneutral movement, two cations, sodium and potassium, and two anions, chloride, now becomes electrogenic because there's no net movement of potassium you get a positive charge on the tubular side of the membrane. This positive charge is a byproduct of the potassium recycling. But the kidney uses this byproduct to force the reabsorption of other cations, magnesium, calcium, and sodium specifically, are reabsorbed through a paracellular pathway. That means a pathway between the cells, not through the cells, and it is driven by that positive charge generated from the recycling of potassium. Let's take a closer look at the loop diuretics. So loop diuretics are active in the tubular fluid. They don't act from the basolateral membrane. They don't get to their active site via the blood. They need to get into the tubular fluid to work. Now, loop diuretics are highly protein bound, and any molecule that's protein bound can't be filtered at the glomerulus. So the way that it enters the tubule is it's secreted in the proximal tubule. Now that secretion is GFR dependent. Hence, the lower the GFR, the less diuretic that makes it to the tubule. We're always talking about dosing for kidney disease. And usually when we talk about renal dosing, we talk about decreasing the dose. That as your kidney function deteriorates, you either need less of the drug or you need to use the drug less often. That's not the case with diuretics. Here when we talk about renal dosing, we use more and more of the drug as the kidneys get weaker and weaker. There's a number of ways to figure out a starting dose for furosemide, but I like to take the serum creatinine in milligrams per deciliter and just multiply it by 20 with a ceiling of around 80 milligrams. At once I'm at 80 milligrams, I'll stop the ascent there, give a test dose, and see what kind of response. If no response, you can go even higher. Let's take a look at how the loop diuretics actually work at the uh, thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Here the Lasix is a green dot, and it blocks the chloride slot. It fits into the chloride slot and shuts down the sodium-potassium-2 chloride transporter. This will increase the renal excretion of sodium, potassium, hydrogen ions causing metabolic alkalosis, calcium, and magnesium. Now there are three loop diuretics, and they have all of different characteristics. The one we're most familiar with is furosemide, goes by the trade name Lasix, but there's two others. There's bumetanide and torsamide. Now they vary primarily from Lasix in terms of bioavailability. I'm going to talk a little bit about bioavailability later, but essentially bioavailability is the ratio of a IV dose to what you need orally. So as you can see with Lasix, if you give this much IV, you'll either need the equivalent amount orally or a whole bunch more and it's hard to predict what the case is on any individual patient. Where the bioavailability of Bumex and Torsamide is much more predictable. The low dose to the high dose is almost identical to the IV dose. And that makes it much easier to convert patients from IV to oral, Bumetanide, and Torsamide. The other big difference is half-life. And you can see that the half-life of Lasix goes from one and a half to two hours. Much shorter half-life with Bumetanide and a longer half-life with torsamide. Let's go back to the bioavailability and talk about what the implications are for patients. So here's a 
patient case. This is a gentleman with a known history of heart failure. He's been taking his medications regularly, but despite that, he has had a 30-pound weight gain over the last month. And today, he was unable to put on his regular shoes and is forced to wear his slippers. He comes to the emergency room with dyspnea and shortness of breath. And in the emergency room, he's given a dose of IV Lasix and promptly begins making copious amounts of urine. Now, the cynic concludes that with such a brisk diuresis, the patient must not have been taking his diuretics. But another possibility that you conclude that this may be a case where the bioavailability of ferrosamide has fallen in this individual from 100% to 10%. Now, how may that occur? It can occur because the edema that we see throughout the body also occurs in the intestinal tract. And as you get increased intestinal edema, that can decrease the absorption of furosemide so that what was an appropriate dose at one point is no longer appropriate for giving him the diuresis he needs. Moving on to half-life. So the half-life of furosemide is one and a half to two hours. Bimetanide is quicker. It has a half-life of one hour. That means it's going to have a very quick onset of action. You give the drug and you immediately see a response. This is useful in the ICU. Torsamide is on the other half of that stick. It has a long half-life from three to four hours. This allows once daily dosing. It is optimal for hypertension and heart failure. In fact, there are clinical studies that have shown that you get decreased hospitalization where the only change you do is switch patients from ferrosamide to torsamide, reduction in hospitalization for heart failure in all causes. So I hope you liked this video. Absolutely make sure to check out the course this video was taken from and to register for a free trial account which will give you access to selected chapters of the course. If you want to learn how MetMastery can help you become a great clinician, make sure to watch the About MetMastery video. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.